Ellen White Reconsidered, a series of presentations for those that have questions about Ellen White's writings. Today's episode is entitled, Why is Her Ministry Needed? Welcome back. We've got another episode for you. But before we do, I want to ask a serious question. And this is one that people have been asking. Why do I need the ministry of Ellen White? Maybe you feel like this fellow. I've made up my mind about Ellen White. I don't think she was a true prophet. Your presentation about false expectations about how she wrote doesn't impress me. And I don't care that she did not technically deny using sources or that she described using sources in the great controversy. I still don't need somebody telling me how to live my life. I'm saved by Jesus, and I don't believe anybody has any prophetic advantage since the time of John. I will live as I feel God impresses me to live. I have Jesus. That's enough. If that's how you feel, then I'm wondering why you're still here. Shouldn't you be doing something else, like reading the Gospel of John or listening to some Christian music? I'm not holding you here. You can go. You're still here. Okay, well, let's continue. So the question is, what can Ellen White's ministry do for you? Now, I can't answer for everybody, but I can answer for myself. And one of the first things that I read really made an impression on me, and it was helpful to me. I'm going to let Ellen White read it to you. It's from her first major book, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. The Fall of Satan The Lord has shown me that Satan was once an honored angel in heaven, next to Jesus Christ. His countenance was mild, expressive of happiness like the other angels. His forehead was high and broad, and showed great intelligence. His form was perfect. He had a noble, majestic bearing. And I saw that when God said to his son, Let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to be consulted concerning the formation of man. He was filled with envy, jealousy, and hatred. He wished to be the highest in heaven, next to God, and receive the highest honors. Until this time all heaven was in order, harmony, and perfect subjection to the government of God. It was the highest sin to rebel against the order and will of God. All heaven seemed in commotion. The angels were marshaled in companies with a commanding angel at their head. All the angels were astir. Satan was insinuating against the government of God, ambitious to exalt himself, and unwilling to submit to the authority of Jesus. Some of the angels sympathized with Satan in his rebellion, and others strongly contended for the honor and wisdom of God in giving authority to his son. And there was contention with the angels. Satan and his affected ones, who were striving to reform the government of God, wished to look into his unsearchable wisdom to ascertain his purpose in exalting Jesus, and endowing him with such unlimited power and command. They rebelled against the authority of the Son of God, and all the angels were summoned to appear before the Father, to have their cases decided. And it was decided that Satan should be expelled from heaven, and that the angels, all who joined with, Satan in the rebellion, should be turned out with him. Then there was war in heaven. Angels were engaged in the battle, Satan wished to conquer the Son of God, and those who were submissive to his will. But the good and true angels prevailed, and Satan, with his followers, was driven from heaven. So Ellen White describes there what happened in heaven. And, and as I read this, I thought, wow, she has such insights into what took place in heaven. This is not something that you get just reading the scriptures, although the story is there. We can go to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 and Revelation 12 and Luke 10. And we find where the Bible describes Satan's rebellion and then how he came to this earth. And then we go to Genesis 3 and we find out how that he tempted our first parents in, in the garden. And these were insights that were really re remarkable to me. As I continued reading her works, not just her picture of heaven, but about her own story, I began to relate to her. And I learned something about the spiritual world where Jesus is involved and Jesus is interested in us is not that far from the world that we live in. How that he would come and, and work in the life of this young lady who was frail, 
sickly and timid, but God was working in, in her life. And that, that was an important thing for me. I began, I, I understood that, that God was also working in my life. So that was a valuable thing that I learned the spiritual principles and the spiritual truths that I learned from reading her writings were something that prepared me for this life, helped me in this life, but also uh, steered me for the life to come. And it helped me to raise healthy children. And for my own life, I was able to get away from some of the health problems that were in my family, my parents and my grandparents. My grandfather, for example, was a smoker and it took a toll on his life in his last years. They were not very pleasant, but I, following the counsels that I learned from Ellen White, avoided those problems. And even at his age, I don't struggle as he did. Then there was my grandmother on my mother's side. Here she is holding me uh, as I was a baby. Um, she had heart problems and ended up going to the doctor and had to use nitroglycerin pills to try to deal with ischemia. But she learned, thankfully, that she could reverse that by changing her dietary. She went, became virtually a vegetarian and lived into her 80s and enjoyed a good life. On my father's side, uh, here's my grandfather, and he was quite tall. He was a shrimper, and, and uh, the folks of Pecan Island and Abbeville, Louisiana, used a lot of foods that uh, I never used. And my grandmother, uh, here putting her hand around my shoulder, she had heart troubles for a long time in her life. My dad was an alcoholic, although he never missed work because of it. It was always something in the background. And fortunately, for the last two years of his life, he lived with my mom. And she enforced the rule that as long as he was there, he wouldn't partake of ethyl. And he had a fairly good life, even though he had uh, dementia in his latter years. So these are some things that I was able to avoid and uh, to pass on to my children. And now, older than my grandparents in these pictures, I am in better shape health-wise. Don't have the heart troubles and the uh, lung problems or the brain problems that my dad had. Also, the weekly Sabbath rest that I get, which was also something that Ellen White and other early Adventists recommended brings a uh, rhythm to my life and uh, balance and rest and focus. We would have been astonished a few decades ago if somebody told us that one day we would carry in our pocket or our pocketbook a combination camera, telephone, linked to the entire world and all of the posted knowledge of the world. But now that we have these devices, it's kind of hard to do without them. They're, it's hard to imagine what life would be without them. We didn't know we needed it until we got it. And that's, that's kind of the way it is for me with Ellen White. I might not have known that I needed the encouragement for a weekly cycle and for my health and to understand how sin and the problems that came into this world originated in heaven and, and were transplanted to this earth. I, I wouldn't have known how that it's going to turn up, how it's going to end. All of these things were just things that I might not have even known that I needed. I've told you in our introductory video about how much this book meant to me, The Desire of Ages, as I began to read it, and the richness that I discovered on the life of Christ. There's so much in this book that adds to the, the richness of Jesus' life. Now, this is not the only book that's ever, that was ever written. 
on the life of Christ and many books that were written on the life of Christ, but none applies it in the spiritual way that this one does. It was written after the style of Hannah's life of Christ. In fact, Ellen White used its the, the chapters of Hannah as storyline guides in, in writing out the chapters. But there's a different focus. Even though there's some similarity to it and to Night Scenes in the Bible of March and some of the others, it has a, a different focus. If you look at the subtitle for this, it's in a series that's called The Conflict of the Ages. And the title, the subtitle for this, you can see that there, tells you that it's the conflict of the ages illustrated in the life of Christ. This great conflict that began in heaven is, is portrayed in a very vivid way here. Over and over again, you can see these instances where Satan is, is described behind the scenes and uh, sometimes stepping out of the shadows like the temptation and at the cross, how he was bringing darkness upon Jesus as he was suffering there and giving his life for us. And the, the beauty of, of those stories are just so very powerful. Well, in our next episode, we're going to spend some time in how she wrote The Desire of Ages. How was this book composed? Uh, I think it'll be instructive and it'll also be inspiring to you. As I have studied this book in different ways over the years, I read it as a student in college and uh, it was a supplementary book for a, a study of the life of Christ. I have studied it as a pastor when I was wanting to prepare lessons on the life of Christ as I would read the gospel accounts just by themselves, and then I would read her book to see if there was any additional insights. And sometimes she would call attention to something that I hadn't seen before. I have studied it for the purposes of responding to the accusations about her credibility and have done considerable work on that issue. All of these different ways. I have been amazed at the work that she did, how it was accomplished, how it even got published. I'll talk, tell you some of that story as well. And how, how much of a vital influence it has been for so many people to read these stories over and over again and to contemplate, as she said, to spend a thoughtful hour on the life of Christ as each of those scenes becomes more vivid to us and we appreciate Jesus. There is such a richness in the desire of ages. And there's also a lot of insights and uh, reflective thoughts that Ellen White brings from the casket, as the introduction says, in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, which was written before Desire of Ages, and then the Great Controversy, which even preceded that. That book as well gives us courage and hope for the future as the end of the great controversy is described when sin and sinners will be no more and harmony and love will reign over the entire expanse of God's created world and all will revel in the knowledge that God is love. There are practical things. I talked with a lady this past summer about this book, Messages to Young People, and how that as she grew up, she didn't have the structure in her life. Her life was chaotic and her family was somewhat dysfunctional. But this book that was taken from different councils, different letters she wrote to young people and, and to parents, it gave her some structure for her own life and made some sense of life and she was able to share that with her nieces and nephews, both practical and spiritual, so many ways that Ellen White's ministry has been a blessing in my life and the lives of many others. Well, I'm so glad you joined us today, and I hope you are too. You have a great day.